I'd like to start by welcoming our special guests, the, the people we're here to, to listen to. First of all, the Ambassador for Portugal to Australia and New Zealand, Mr Rui Quatin Santosh, the Ambassador for Ireland to Australia and New Zealand, Mr Noel White, and from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Assistant Secretary for the EU and Western Europe branch, Mr Peter Doyle, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Ambassador White, let me start with you if I can. Uh, we'll start generally and then we can drill down into a few issues. Why is Ireland a member of the EU? Has it helped or hindered Ireland in the challenges you've faced in, in recent years? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you want more than that. Um, <laughs> I think to understand why Ireland is a member of the European Union, uh, you have to go back to the start. As to when, when we joined in 1973. Don't worry, I'm going to truncate this. But um, if you think back to 1973, or indeed into the 60s, when we, uh, we first put forward our candidature to become um, members of the, the then European uh, Economic Community, um, we were a small, isolated country in many ways, politically and economically. Uh, we had a, an economy based almost entirely uh, on agriculture, uh, totally protected and totally dependent uh, on the vagaries of the UK market. Um, and there was a, a strong view had developed at the time that we needed to open our economy up, we needed to develop, uh, we needed to move into new areas and so on. And that the way to do that, the most effective way to do that, was to do that through the vehicle of uh, the, um, the then EEC, which we eventually joined uh, in, after a referendum in 1973, we acceded. And it's interesting to note, actually, next year is our 40th year, the anniversary of our accession. Um, has it helped? Yes, it's helped enormously. Uh, we have grown from being that small, isolated country into a country which now has a space on the world stage. I think we have done very well overall. We have developed politically and economically. We have an economy which is much more balanced. Uh, we're leaders in the whole area of exports, <coughs> exports of uh, high-tech software and so on. We've gone through various phases in our economy where essentially we have industrialized at a stage later than many other countries which would have been prompted and assisted by European Union membership. And just to add to that, um, I think the, 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 the means of achieving that economic progress, for instance through infrastructure and so on, uh, has been helped enormously uh, by the membership, by our membership of the European Union. Uh, and we have I think uh, moving away from the pure ec hard economic side of this, it's fair to say that uh, our membership of the, of the now European Union has, it has broadened our horizons as a people. Okay. Ambassador Quartin Santosh, your, your view on why, first of all, Portugal is a member of the EU and if the, your nation, like Ireland, has faced challenges in recent years, has it helped or, or hindered? Well, Portugal joined uh, the European Union, then was the European Economic uh, Community in 1986 for two main reasons. First, to consolidate democracy. As you know, we had uh, well, a, a bit of a different past with the colonial, uh, colonial, we still had colonies until 1975 practically. We underwent a revolution. We had some challenges also in terms of democratic stability after that, and the main idea was to consolidate democratic mm -hmm. institutions and democracy through joining the European Economic Community. We had already a trade agreement concluded with them in 1972, and we were already members of EFTA since 1960. But I must say that we had isolated due to our colonial policy internationally, and that we traditionally turned our back to the, on, the, on, the, on the continent. We were turned to the, the sea, our alliances were with maritime powers, first with the United Kingdom of Great Britain and then with the United States. And the idea of involving in an uh, organization, you know, with uh, other countries in continental Europe was something that the previous regime did not, you know, uh, favor. This is one reason. The second one was certainly economic. It was really to uh, develop, to achieve development. Our country was, uh, even for European standards, or for European standards, and even in general standards, backwarded somehow in 1985. And we achieved a tremendous, we brought about, and many changes were brought about by joining the, the now the European Union in terms of, uh, you know, infrastructure in the countries, of training programs, of. Uh, changing completely the structure of our economy, becoming more 
open to, uh, to international trade and investment. I would say our living standards improved tremendously, even through now you are going, as you know, through difficult times. Uh, if you were in Portugal in 1985 and you could compare being there again in 2010, the changes were enormous. So I would say that it's quite a positive you know, assessment of our joining uh, the, the European Union. Peter Doyle, can you give us a sense of Australia's relationship with the EU? How valuable is it and how has it progressed in the, la the last decade or two? Um, we, we value highly our relations with the EU uh, it's, and it's come a long way in the 50 years. I'd like to start by congratulating uh, Professor Lowe and the ANU Centre for European Studies for uh, putting on this initiative that's, that's one of the activities in which we're hoping to celebrate this uh, 50th anniversary of relations between Australia and, uh, and the EU. I won't go back quite 50 years, but um, one way that we, I suppose, many Australians, when they first think of the EU from a historical perspective, they'd cast their minds back to when the United Kingdom decided to join um, the European Union. And for us, at, that was, for many in Australia, that was quite a traumatic experience. Um, primarily, I, th I think, in a very practical way, because we, we lost preferential trade access, particularly for our agricultural goods. But also, I think we felt a little bit abandoned, um, you know, by, by Mother England. Uh, it, it turned out, of course, to be very good for us uh, in a number of ways. It turned out to be very good for the way that we uh, restructured our economy and it turned out to be uh, an excellent way to take advantage of this multiplier effect that both ambassadors have mentioned, that you know, the EU is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. Uh, and since those days, it certainly you know, it continues to grow in importance and it's something that, that we in Australia have realised and we've put effort into wanting to work with the EU. Uh, as I said, we used to sort of see things, I think, primarily through a reasonably narrow trade focus and particularly we used to focus a little bit on the problems that we had, particularly to do with the common agricultural po uh, policy. I mean, that policy remains, uh, you know, there's been some reforms, but it, it remains that we remain, you know, not, not its biggest fans, I think it's fair to say. But, but we also, you know, we're focused much more now on what we can do in a positive way together with the EU. You know, we're like-minded in so many ways and on, on the big global issues, we find ourselves very close together. And so, you know, with, we, we work together in, in an enormous number of ways. Uh, and where our relations went to a, a new level last year when we had, for the first time, a visit by uh, President of the European Commission, President Barroso visited in September last year and then the High Representative for Catherine Ashton visited soon after that. We had a number of commissioners here um, last year as well. Yeah. So things are really you know, going from strength to strength at the moment. Something that ha hasn't been that strong in the last little while, Ambassador White, is, is the, uh, obviously we're, we're all very w well aware of the Eurozone and uh, its problems recently. Mm. How do you see the EU in, in 10 to 15 years? Will it survive as we know it now? Will it, will it be stronger then? Will it lose maybe one or two members along the way? This is, I mean, this is, this, is, this is crystal ball stuff. I mean, what will it be like in 15 years? Would, if you'd asked the question 15 years ago, what will it be like now? Uh, we, would, we would have said that we, would, we wouldn't be talking about a Eurozone crisis. Um, so the short answer to your question is what it will be like in 15 years, I don't know. Uh, but uh, am I confident that the broad elements which are in place now and the, 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 the process the, that, uh, through the, which the community and the union has evolved to get to where it is, am I confident that that process will continue? The answer is very much yes. Um, the precise form, I don't know. The business, to speculate, I don't want to speculate about the business of will there be X, Y, or Z in it or out of it. Um, I don't think it. I don't. I don't think it it, it. it. It lends anything to the argument. I don't think it brings any light, uh, whatsoever. Um, but I am confident, and I know that those of us who are members of the European Union, directly involved in it, and have in many ways grown up with it, uh, don't share. Uh, the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the menacing narrative that is coming out of some quarters, which I believe is agenda-driven, 
uh, around the future of the European Union and suggesting that somehow uh, it's all about to come apart. Um, as, as someone said, the, 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 the rumours rumors, rumor, rumors of our demise are, are, are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> uh, I, I think this is the case. Um, I did... I did take the step of listening to some of the previous programmes in this series before coming out, and this, this has been rehearsed on a number of occasions, and you will see many of our colleagues saying the same thing in a very unprompted and natural way, uh, that the perspective that we have of where the crisis is and where the union is going um, from a European perspective and from the media and just, just the, the public discourse that we're dealing with differs in many ways from the perception that we're seeing, it was certainly portrayed in the, in the Australian media and in, in other international media. Now, we could discuss all day why that is. Um, it doesn't matter. It just is slightly different. I think there's a more nuanced um, sense of the discussion at the, at the, at the European end. Could, could I just say, and I, just to, to loop over and back, but just briefly on your, on your first question, um, I think it's important to say, and I think Rui would agree with me on this, we're very often asked about this question of what has it meant for you to be in the European Union and so on. I think it's also important to point out that we like to think in our humility that we bring something to the table as well mm. uh, through that process uh, over the years, that it's not all one-way traffic. Mm. This is a union, it's family, and uh, in a family we all have to, to bring something to the table. Ambassador Cortin Santos, do you share your colleagues' uh, optimism about the union? Yes, I share the optimism. I agree with him. It's a question mark. We don't know in 15 years' time. Well, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. But I cannot conceive already a Europe without European Union. I think that uh, what was achieved, what it means for 500 million people already being in the European Union, I'm not even mentioning the historical context. I mean, why the European Union was politically so important at, uh, at the beginning. Oh, we all know why, and it's still, I believe, important. But uh, I cannot conceive for instance, what will be Europe and what will be world economy and uh, global finance without the euro. I think that the unraveling of euro, uh, and the other way around maybe to see this question, is really to imagine what will be the world or the economy in the world and the global financial system without euro. If the euro breaks up, uh, the consequences will be devastating for all of us. And uh, I think that... Uh, well, we certainly have difficult, as you know, we have different perspectives, 17 countries involved in the Euro project, 27 European Union, there are national interests, there are across the border, you know, uh, uh, exposures, there are a lot of reasons that uh, made things difficult, but I believe that uh, at the end of the game we have to conclude that it's not possible to let I mean, the Euro down. And if Europe survives, certain European Union will survive. And I believe even can give an impetus in the need to overcome this crisis will give an added impetus to more integration. Because I think if you have a common currency and we are coping with these problems and uh, handling these uh, <coughs> circumstances, it's because something more has to be added to make the euro work. Okay. And maybe certainly if you have a common currency, we have to have more things in common maybe than we have now and to integrate more than we are now. So I think that maybe I don't want to sound as this for you know, negative, negative reasons, but I think it's also very important when we weigh pros and cons and to see what is really the alternatives and the costs of alternatives that Euro will survive and that European Union will, will thrive, I hope. Peter Doyle, on that point that the ambassador referred to on greater integration, it was something that the leaders at the... G20 in Mexico had been, had been arguing for, certainly the non-European leaders, including our Prime Minister. There was subsequently a, a summit in June of European leaders. How does Australia see progress towards uh, greater fiscal integration, something that many believe is important if the monetary union is to survive as it is? Uh, the, the G20 leaders, as, as you rightly point out, did call for... Uh, greater action within, within Europe and within the EU and the Eurozone. And um, our Prime Minister, of course, amongst others, made the point that, you know, we've moved beyond these arguments about austerity or growth. It needs to be both. Uh, you know, yes, there, there does seem to be progress towards uh, a more integrated fiscal approach and a banking union. And all of those, all of those elements mm -hmm. were then taken up in, as you said, the... Uh, the EU Council meeting at the end of June. Uh, and that, that did, I think um, President Van Rompuy's, I think the first line of one of his statements was that, you know, 
we are now acting to break the link between sovereigns and banks. So that that, that, that vicious loop where, you know, wh whatever bad news in one is automatically bad news in the other. Um, and so that the, particularly the initiative that to have the European stability mechanism be able to lend directly to banks rather than through sovereigns so it, it goes on a government's balance sheets, it will, it will go directly to banks. Um, this, of course, is not yet in place, but, you know, and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but, you know, these are very positive developments. There was also, of course, things on the growth agenda to do with um, infrastructure spending. And so there, there was a lot of good that came out of, of that June summit. Um, you know, we, we acknowledge that this is a very difficult process. It's been going on for quite some time and it will, uh, let's hope it'll be finished in months rather than years, but, you know, some of these reforms are, are, are very deep and far-reaching. And so it's, you know, we in Australia shouldn't be surprised that there's a little bit of, you know, that there's strong contrary views, that there's, you know, these are important issues that Europe's arguing about. And it's only natural that, you know, positions are put strongly. Um, and, but I share the ambassadors, both ambassadors' view that I think Europe will come through this and it's clear that, you know, the objective is greater integration. Mm. Uh, and we, we have to remember too, I think, that, you know, the, the European project, as Europeans like to call it, it it's, it's about more than money. You know, that it's, okay, these current difficulties are about money, um, but, you know, Europe itself is about a lot more than that. And so, you know, we've always seen it as a, as a, as a major political project, and so that you know, we're, we're confident that the political aspirations of Europe's leaders and peoples will be realised. And uh, Ambassador White, on the issue of your country's relations with Australia, how does mm. the membership of the EU feed into that? We obviously know the great people-to-people -people links between mm. Ireland and Australia. How would you characterise the, the, the relationship today? I think. I think. Uh, <coughs> In a way, it's important to set them in context. In, 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 a rea in reality, what you have here is Ireland has a long, has long-standing relationship with Australia, obviously, and a particular relationship with Australia, which, uh, which goes back to uh, the, the the start of the of the, of the European settlement here, um, and uh, that's that is a very deep. There are deep ties of kinship that bind our countries, and the Irish people have been involved. Uh, in Australia and have contributed importantly at political, social, cultural and economic levels and continue to do so down through the years. And it's important, I think, that, that is the starting point of our relationship with Australia. Uh, the fact of our membership of the European Union, uh, I think, complements that uh, very well. If you, if you consider, for example, the framework agreement, I think Peter mentioned earlier on, the framework agreement which is currently being negotiated, if you, continue, if you consider the fact that, uh, to go back to your initial question, uh, that you know, you have a country like Ireland that is at the table as part of an EU uh, um, uh, organisation. Um, then we are players in that. We are active, active participants in that. That puts a different quality on the relationship, but it complements what is also a very a long-standing and very solid and well-established uh, relationship. It doesn't take from it, but I think it certainly complements it. And what, and what about for, for Portugal? How do, how do the two? Uh, yes, we start having diplomatic relations in 1960 and our community is now is 50,000 people strong and they start coming here in every 50, so it's uh, much less intense and not as deep as, as Ireland, which Ireland, uh, Ireland culture is a uh, part, I would say, of the backbone of, the, of this country in cultural terms. Thank you. Not, exa <laughs> not exactly <laughs> the same. Right. As you say, <laughs> it's said that we well, came... <laughs> It's said that we came here in the 16th century. I don't know, it's not demonstrated. And even if we had, if we had done it, we keep it so secret that nobody <laughs> knew. And uh, let alone Captain Cook, the poor one, because he had to do anything from scratch because there was no indication from past experience to, to help him in exploiting this eastern coast of Australia. But nevertheless, we have uh, certainly, I think we, we, did, uh, we didn't live up to our potential in our relationship. Our trade is still modest, even though we have exported much more to Australia in the last uh, two years, maybe due to the efforts of the Portuguese companies being squeezed at yeah. home. Yeah. Now they tend to internationalize and get more open and seek for other markets, alternative markets, but still it's quite modest. But we are like-minded countries. We have uh, been together, for instance, in Afghanistan and, uh, and East Timor. It's uh, something important for both countries for, for different reasons. And so we value very much the relation with Australia. I think that we have, we should have more people-to-people -people contacts. 
uh, the tendency for exchanges more tourists from Australia are going to Portugal very clearly than more <coughs> Portuguese to Australia. Certainly the wealth is different and the currency now is also much more attractive for Australians to travel abroad and to make tourism in Portugal and for Portuguese to come here. But anyway, there is a certain trend for uh, some people more qualified than in the past, I must say, in terms of training and education try to, to come to Australia and to also to help Australia overcome the labor shortages mm -hmm. that you know. But uh, what is also very important, being part of the European Union, we are part of common policy. For instance, trade policy, uh, as you know, is, is common, so we abide by the same rules. We are part of a very large group. In the dialogue with Australia, we are a part of that group, so this certainly enhances I mean, the, the presence and the visibility of, uh, of a country. That, um that reference to the, the skill shortage, I think, segues well into something uh, that Ireland and Australia mm. um, are experiencing at the moment, the human capital element. Mm. A lot of Irish here, yeah. skilled and unskilled mm -hmm. workers, give us a sense of, of the magnitude of, of uh, what's happening on that front. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, what, I, what I tend to point out to people as well this is that this is an element of the relationship between the two countries. It's not the sum total of the relationship. There's, there is more to it. I mean, historically, Irish people have emigrated in times of economic hardship, and we are now in a time of economic hardship. I mean, we don't have a policy of emigration as such, but this is what people, what, what, what people do. It's, it's, it, it, it's been, it has been part of the Irish narrative uh, for many years. Uh, and uh, we have found over the years too that uh, in Australia, um, a very welcoming home for Irish people. Um, that that there is a very there is a very good again complementarity between, at the moment, uh, be in particular between your needs and our needs. You have a skills shortage. We have an unemployment problem. Um, to try and quantify it. Um, I suppose the, the the headline figures on this would be that we are in terms of. 457 skilled visa, temporary skilled visas. Um, Ireland is now in the top three source countries um, for, for 457s. Um, and we would be in the top 10 in the emigrant uh, category. Um, so we're seeing significant rises at the moment. I think there's probably a snapshot of around on the holiday, work holiday visas, I think what you're, that's what you're referring to when mm. you speak about the unskilled. We're probably looking at a snapshot at the moment of about 20,000 at this time. Um, but um, it certainly feels like there's an awful lot more than 20,000 when mm. you go out there because mm. um, there are Irish people everywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, and that's it's, fine. It's a good thing, though, isn't it? Uh, if, it you, is, if you've, uh, beyond, the, I, uh, beyond I, the drinking of Guinness and so on, if you've got problems at home, I mean, mm. we've got job shortages here. Yeah. Why not, why not uh, fill That's the an appalling national stereotype, but I'll pass over it. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there's more to it than that. I mean, I know, but seriously, I think. Uh, that the Irish people, and I've said this before, and it would sound you could say I would say this, Irish people have contributed seriously to this country at a very serious level, mm. politically, economically, culturally, and so on, and that continues to be the case. We fit in very, very well mm. here, uh, partly because uh, we reckon that um, approximately one third, one in three Australians can claim some form of Irish heritage. Including uh, two on the stage, I think. Uh, Myself and Peter. This, this, yeah. this, is, this, this is Peter, you know, and, um, and he's, he's come back from Ireland recently mm. and he senses that sense of belonging. It's good. Um, but, uh, no, this is, there, there is a deep tie between us and uh, uh, right now, as I say, you have a particular issue, we have a particular issue and these two things uh, fit, fit, uh, fit very well. I should add, I mean, I, I think that, that, that from our point of view, my, my objective, you know, what, what, what gets me going in the morning is the concept of trying to do whatever I can to increase the trade and economic and investment and business relationship between our two countries so that we can regenerate and rejuvenate the Irish economy so that the kind of jobs yeah. that we need are created in Ireland. Uh, and that, and I don't mean to sound ungracious or ungrateful about this, but that the Irish people would not be the, the solution to the Australian skills shortage. Mm. Um, but right now, we, we, have, uh, we have shared objectives in this, and I think, it, I think it works quite well. But clearly, our objective is about getting the Irish economy back to where we would want it to be and tackling what is the real problem for us at the moment, which is the unemployment difficulty. Yeah, absolutely. Unemployment upwards of 14%, I think. We'll get, yeah. we'll get back to okay. the, the trade relationship, because I'm interested to talk about the business links as well with mm -hmm. the two nations and Australia. Uh, Peter, with the EU generally, though, it's, this is something I think a lot of Australians don't, understand is how big that market is to us. We talk about China a lot, but number two in terms of trading is, is the EU, and it's the biggest investor 
isn't it? Mm, that's right. It's, uh, I mean, despite its current difficulties, you know, Europe remains extremely important to us and it really matters globally. If you take the EU as an entity, of course, it's the largest economy in the world, uh, responsible for, I think, about a 30% of global GDP. It's a, it's a 17 or 18 trillion dollar economy, as someone said, 500 million people. So it's, you know, it, it's important to everybody, uh, not just to Australia. Um, as you correctly mentioned, it's our second most important trading partner and our most important investment partner. And the, these are things that don't attract much attention. Um, but, and part of the reason for that is because they're so mature. It's such a mature commercial relationship that it's not, um, it's not headline grabbing in any way. Uh, but it's something that you know we're we're acutely aware of, and and, it, and that's to you know of great mutual benefit. And on things like on trade policy, of course, the EU is now represents um, the trade policy. That's a that's an EU competency rather than a member state competency. And um, you know on on, mul on the multilateral trade agenda, mm. is we often find ourselves on many issues close as close to the EU position as we are to anybody else's. Mm. So there's um, the way that we pursue a more, a more open global system, um, you know, the EU is a key ally there as well. Your, your countries have both uh, had, had bailouts and making progress towards dealing with the, the, the crises that uh, the two nations have faced in, in economic terms. Your neighbour though, Spain, is in, is in a whole lot of uh, trouble at the moment economically. Obviously there'll be very big implications for Portugal. In terms of your, in terms in terms of your exports, how important is Spain, and how can you look to other nations, Australia among them, to be a destination for your uh, for your business you, and your business goods? Yes, Spain is a very important economic partner, especially since our common uh, accession to the European Union is the fact that we develop much more our relations than in the past. And it's a very important trade pattern, as you pointed out. I think we are exporting to Spain more or less 23% of our, of our goods and services. It's a very important partner, for instance, in terms of tourism. Uh, and so, you know, uh, certainly uh, the crisis, uh, well, it's a fact. I don't want to dwell on that. Certainly my colleague next month, my Spanish colleague, will dwell on that more appropriately than myself. But it's certainly, you know, that the reflects on our, on our country will be certainly, uh, certainly important and severe. Even though we have been uh, reducing, I would say, our dependency on European markets recently. Uh, in the past, we had 80% of our exports oriented to Europe and 20% overseas. Now it's 30% and 70 to Europe, even less. And we are making big efforts in outside markets to offset, you know, all the difficult economic environment and some downturn already in Europe. But even though I must say that the Spanish downturn was 0.3, I believe 0.4 in these last, uh, last three months, it's not exactly, you know, something else. I believe there is also much noise about it, but we must also have in mind that the Spanish debt is low. It's around 69%, it's much lower than many other countries in Europe. So I think they, they have certain room for manoeuvring that sometimes we forget they, they still have. But anyway, uh, certainly being such an important part, and, and our interconnections are not only trade, uh, banking systems, we have banks, uh, Spanish banks operating in Portugal, Portuguese banks operating in Spain. There is a lot, you know, it's intertwining between our two countries, so certainly we are worried. It's a headwind, you know, uh, in country of... Uh, 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 hindering our, our, our capacity to deal with the crisis and certainly have to take that into account, unfortunately. But we hope that also uh, things will go to the best and we'll, we will end up in the, in the best way possible. Okay. And that these present difficulties will be overcome. Ambassador White, we, we spoke about the people yeah. connections. What are the business links like between Ireland and uh, Australia? The business, links, the business links are very good. Um, we have about, at the moment, I think about eight, 80, 80 plus um, Irish companies with offices of some sort, some sort of base here uh, in Australia. There are about 35 Australian companies 
uh, in Ireland. That's, that's not the, the, the 80 is not the complete picture. There are more than that because if you take in multinationals and others, they would have their head offices in Ireland. Um, but um, our, our Trade Development Board, Enterprise, Enter Enterprise Ireland, uh, which deals for the most part with indigenous Irish companies, uh, is uh, would puts Australia as about as in terms of ninth in terms of its global uh, ninth in the hierarchy of, of, of global of markets globally, um, so that's that's particularly important. And we found niche areas as well uh, around um, farm particular products. Again, high tech products, sophisticated products, pharmaceuticals, medical care devices. Um, on the high-tech software side, financial services, uh, e-learning, health software, government software as well. There's a lot of that going on. We're supporting it and getting it out there. Um, and I'm pleased you asked that because, again, we do. when I go out, I tend to be asked about the human capital issue mm -hmm. and about yeah. our, the Irish here and so on. Um, that, that is a good part of this story that is going on, of this bilateral relationship mm. uh, that is going on and going on happening, going on extremely well. Mm. Uh, exports are hugely important to us. We export pretty much everything that we make, more or less. Mm. Um, and uh, we're a small open economy. We trade, so we require a trading environment that, that's, that's, that, that is unchallenged and is functioning well. Um, so it's important to us that we get uncertainty. That is the... Uh, priority issue, if you like, for us, for those of us in the administration and in the system who are trying to, uh, to, to buttress and support, and support the economy. Uh, I, think, I think that uh, we will see more improvements in that we, we, as the years go by, but the, the um, Australian side as well is, 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 there are significant exports coming from, ex imports into Ireland, mm -hmm. exports from Australia, imports into Ireland as well, um, and uh, it's a healthy relationship. When um, you, you talk about the, well, obviously there's been a, a fair bit of Im improvement in recent times from a, from a, from a difficult starting point yeah. and through this crisis. But as an observer from Australia, we looked at Ireland as a powerhouse economy. Mm. Uh, in, in just a decade or so mm. ago, it was, it was booming. Mm. What happened? What, what, how, did it, how, how did it go wrong? How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, in a nutshell, I suppose if, if you consider where we were coming from, and again, we exist in a broader uh, uh, ecosphere, I think uh, if you look at the period, take the period from the mid-90s to the early, thousands, early, early 2000s, there you have a period where um, Ireland is starting to bring it all together in terms of solid infrastructure, is reaping the benefits of, its infra the, of the investment in infrastructure, investment in education. Um, it's, um, it's good dem demographics, a lot of young people, highest birth rate in the European Union, um, highly educated workforce. All of these elements are coming together and you have uh, a booming economy uh, existing in a, within a global economy. Um, from the period through probably from 2001 through up to, up, up to 2007, again as part of the broader context in which we were, in which we were operating, and we were, weren't unusual in this, um, firstly I'd have to accept that there were certain fiscal choices, fiscal policy options, which clearly in retrospect weren't, weren't the right ones, which developed into a, into a property bubble, and we, we, we know about that. Uh, but I think uh, there was a, a period where uh, certainly on the, on the banking and financial side, there was, we, we, weren't, we didn't sufficiently regulate the system uh, to a situation where high personal debt uh, became um, an important factor. Uh, Over-reliance in government uh, on um, cyclical revenue, stamp duty, for want of a better word, um, and um, imba those imbalances in the economy, plus the fact that now you had bank a banking sector, I suspect, moving away really from the old prudent deposit-based system into wholesale markets and short-term money and so on. But again, I hasten to add, uh, this wasn't a purely Irish phenomenon. This was a phenomenon which was happening uh, through, the, uh, through the union. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that, that that level of exposure becomes a problem uh, when you have an outside shock. And we've had an, we had an outside shock. Uh, people tend to point to layman's. Of course, it's never as simple as that. Mm. Uh, but around that time, for, um, for historical purposes, it's easy to point to layman's today. Uh, that left us completely exposed. Loan books were exposed. Balance sheets, uh, bank balance sheets were off. Uh, and uh, they, were, they were losing value rapidly. Mm. Uh, and we had a situation where the government was faced with no option 
but to uh, put in place a bank guarantee, which subsequently has been criticised. Um, but again, with the, with the, with the, with, it's easy to do that with the value, with the, the benefit of 2020 uh, mm. um, hindsight. Uh, at the time, it was applauded uh, as the right thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, the situation, the global situation, continued to, to deteriorate. Marcus lost confidence, and we uh, reached an agreement with the IMF, ECB, and DU on a, on a support on a support program. Um, that's a, a long-winded way of explaining broadly what happened yeah. in, in, in economic terms. Um, I think the point I'd like to leave you with on it is that 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 it's it's. Uh, it, 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 it's an economy within a global economy, if you mm -hmm. like. Certainly, we made wrong op wrong policy options. We took yeah. wrong decisions at various points, and that has been documented. And you know, we've mm -hmm. we've acknowledged, of course, we've acknowledged all of that. Mm -hmm. It's clear. Uh, but where we were and what we were doing was not unusual. The difficulty for an economy, and I, su I suspect Rui has the same issue with this, is that again, if you were a small trading nation and you're completely exposed to the winds of the global economy mm -hmm. uh, and to the implications of what happens out there, you're not entirely in control of it. With um, obviously with uh, Australia's economic future, China is so important. I know that you were ambassador um, in in Beijing before you were posted here to Canberra. How do you see the relationship between your nation, the EU, China? Obviously, Chinese exports to Europe are enormous, and that has a, th a flow-on effect to Australia. How do you see that? Uh, that relationship? Well, they got much closer in the last years because I believe that. Uh, Till to the mid last decade, in Portugal, people, even economic actors, you know, business, were not very much aware what was going on in China. I believe there was a wake-up call, maybe also prompted by the crisis, to find new markets and to find uh, new business opportunities. And so, we have in the last years developed enormously our relations with China, we are exporting four times more than we were exporting some few years ago. Well. We have a special relation with China, as you know. We were the first Europeans to get into China by sea, 1516. We were in Macau since 16th century. <laughs> and uh, maybe it was, uh, in our memory, it was not very clear because uh, sometimes when I asked, I was there, I asked some Portuguese businessmen, why don't you come and make business in China? Oh, it's too far away, they speak a strange language. <laughs> I was astonished because I believe that we should be certain as of having a pioneer role, we should have certainly developed a much closer relation with the Chinese. Now I think that things are quite different. Uh, the smooth transition in Macau helped a lot. It's very important that a political backdrop to the relationship be a sound one for the economic sector also to have some good chances of progress. And uh, that political part, I think, was quickly done. We have a close relations with, uh, with China. We have the Macau as, I would say, like a, a springboard. You know, the Chinese have even created, together with Portuguese-speaking countries, a Macau Forum for Economic and Trade Relations with Portuguese-speaking mm -hmm. countries, which is bearing its, its, its fruits, involving countries like Brazil and Angola, which are, you know, very big. and. Uh, a very important market and a very important source of raw materials for the Chinese. And the Chinese are also starting to invest in Portugal. The privatization program that we have started, you know, as a part of our program for economic and financial adjustment includes uh, privatization of several important, uh, you know, companies and the Chinese are already there. And I believe Chinese banks are also uh, tapping the market to see if they should come to Portugal. So I would say that we uh, achieved, you know, a different level, uh, more, you know, a more promising level of relationship than I would say ten years ago. But uh, well, certain trade policy is common to European Union. We coordinate, you know, close with our with our partners as everyone in the European Union. But each one of us has certainly to try to attract as much business and investment as possible in accordance with the common rules, you know, which are applicable. And uh, so I would say that uh, the Chinese is an important part now of these efforts that we have made to uh, foster our exports. In fact, our exports have been growing strongly since 2010, offsetting partially the fallout from the crisis and the fallout from, you know, the the downturn in domestic consumption, and China has played an important role in that because we are growing our exports 
around 15% a year since 2010, and China has played also an important role. Still, there is a lot of potential, and I believe that, uh, and still the trade, the relations still are balanced. They export much more to us, manufacturing products, as you know. And uh, but anyway, we are making a big effort, and uh, and the account is more balanced. Peter Doyle, can I get your thoughts on Australia's relations with the EU, the flow and effects from? I suppose if we look at the economic front, China, when they have a slowdown in exports to Europe, that affects Australia directly. But also more broadly, just give us a sense of Australia's view in, in how China fits in to our, our Euro Europe relations, because obviously it impacts everything when it comes to Australia. Uh, yes. <laughs> I suppose it, it does. I mean, we're, as you know, the government's now working on a, on a white paper on the Asia century. Uh, and some of these themes will be will be taken up um, within that. Of course, you know the fact that we're you know, we're in the Asian century doesn't mean that everybody else disappears or, or becomes irrelevant. Um, and as, as the ambassador mentioned, I think that um, European interest in our part of the world has well, yes, it goes back to the 16th century, but in recent years it's been developing quite rapidly. Uh, when, when we talk to friends in Europe, we, we make the point that, uh, important as China is, uh, you know, Asia, that, that's not the only story in Asia. Um, that we, you know, we welcome European interest in the region, we welcome um, you know, the EU's interest in the region, uh, and we encouraging them, and, and I think they're moving in this direction themselves in many ways, that it's it's not just it's not only a business story and it's not only a China story, that um, you know there's a lot more there's a lot more reasons to pay attention to what's happening in this part of the world, um, and that you know Europe has a has a valuable role to play, because obviously the United States is uh, has pivoted on on another front and uh, and there's a great deal of focus from the United States as well in uh, in this part of the world at the moment. Uh, if we've got any questions from the floor, please. Uh, joining the conversation if uh, you'd like to introduce yourself and throw in a question to one of the ambassadors or, uh, or Mr Doyle, please feel free. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nina Markovic. Um, I have a few hats, but tonight I have a hat of, um, of a PhD student here at the centre. Um, I have questions for all of you, um, the presenters. I mean, if you want to add, please do. Um, the question for Mr Doyle is, um, what do we as Australia, what do we expect from the upcoming negotiations of a treaty level agreement. What are our priorities? Some politicians might be asking why are we doing it? So uh, if I could get some, I, I know general comments on that, that would be, that would be appreciated. Um, a question for both ambassadors. Um, countries <coughs> such as Serbia are quite worried given the current crisis in Europe. And um, there have been quite a few statements in recent um, months and in recent years that after Croatia's entry there will be a slowdown in further enlargement. Um, other countries in the region also are fearing that the train has already passed um, the rest of the ex-Yugoslav um, space and they're looking at geopolitical alternatives such as Turkey, Russia, even investments from Azerbaijan, which was quite puzzling. So what would your comments be to <coughs> countries such as Serbia in terms of um, over basically looking at uh, to the east, at perhaps southeast as well, and uh, should they lose hope, or should they still be hopeful? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador White. First of all, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting a aspect of the of of the, again of the evolution of the European Union at this point, and and and, and when people talk of its its demise and crisis, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, lurching from crisis to crisis, uh, that there 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 is there, there is still a lineup of people of countries uh, that want to join. Um, I think that says most eloquently what we can say about where the European Union is at, that those people who stand, countries that stand back and assess what the entire package is about realise that it's a very valid and a solid one. Um, I, I, I can't comment on the options, as you've described them, that are available, uh, that Serbia might be, might be looking at, uh, but, but, but certainly the, uh, the history of enlargement process, the, of, of processes over the years has shown that 
um, the, the the rhythm or the speed with which those process, that that process takes place in various countries is is affected by a whole series of factors, um, not least the preparedness of the applicant country uh, at a particular time, but also the preparedness or the situation, the general economic and political situation of the union as a whole mm. in terms of receiving a particular country in. And it's a complex process. And although we have there are established chapters under which these things are enlargements are negotiated. Uh, it differs from country, from country to country, uh, but quite clearly, there is a serious process that has been engaged uh, between Serbia uh, and the European Union. Um, and quite clearly, there's a strong body of opinion in Serbia that believes that that is that is still a viable a viable prospect, and that's I think that that's reciprocated on the European Union side. Ambassador, your thoughts? Well, since now as a European specialist, I have practically nothing to add. But uh, I think, as he said, it's a really a sign of the importance attached to the European Union that even uh, against the, the background of these difficult countries are still you know, striving to join the European Union. I think that uh, Serbia was somehow, as you said, uh, already in the, uh, a certain advanced stage, you know, of joining, and things will be in the right track. I don't know if there is any internal factors now. I was told that maybe in last elections when we met the leadership of the country would not favor that much joining European Union. But I believe that the tendency, as we have been detected in the, in our continent, is for the countries step by step, you know, getting close and joining. So I don't see any reasons why Serbia would be left out. And okay, uh, anyone else for a question? Uh, Peter, your thoughts? Did you want to contribute to that at all? Uh, I'll, I'd like to answer, uh, answer the question about the framework agreement. Oh, which, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, do it. Uh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, you're, you're, you're very well informed. And uh, this, we are in the process of negotiating a treaty level framework agreement between Australia and the EU. And uh, we will have the fourth round of negotiations uh, tomorrow and Friday here in Canberra. Uh, this came from, as I was talking before, about the increasing seriousness with which we regard the EU um, as an international partner, particularly post the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and this decision was made, well, was announced uh, when the Prime Minister made her first trip as Prime Minister, was in fact to Brussels uh, in October 2010. And during that visit, um, she announced that we would, uh, we would negotiate this framework agreement to take our relationship with the EU you know, into, a, into the modern era, if you like. Um, we, negotiations were launched when the High Representative, Catherine Ashton, visited Canberra in October last year. Excuse me. And as I said, we're about to commence the fourth round of negotiations and we intend, we have a shared objective of concluding negotiations this year. Um, the rationale is, as I say, it's about increasing seriousness and to, to put our relations on a new level. Um, we, we know that, well, our understanding is that within the way that the EU system works, this will facilitate cooperation in other areas. Um, and so we want to get practical benefits in areas like uh, climate change, education cooperation, uh, develop aid delivery is, um, in common. So there's a whole range of quite specific practical things that we wish to advance through concluding this treaty level agreement. Anyone else have a question? Uh, gen gentlemen, I also speak on behalf of the, of the centre, of which I'm a, a visiting fellow. I guess I wanted to thank you uh, for your courage in coming out to face an audience and answer questions about a situation <coughs> from which very few, I think, can see an easy exit. Our hope is that you will muddle through. That's point one. Point two is, um, given the Irish ambassador's answer to the first question, I would suggest that Brussels should engage the Irish in future as their media spokespeople, um, but that's a compliment, Mr. Ambassador. And um, <laughs> but we've, I think, appreciated your considered answers. Mine is rather a comment on top of the thanks, rather than a question to you, and that is that 
my colleague asked a very good question, uh, and it allowed, it enabled the Irish ambassador to note that there are people lining up to join the EU, despite its serious circumstances. There are people lining up to come to Australia, probably for similar reasons. According to a senior Russian official, in the last three years, 1.4 or 1.5 million Russians have emigrated from Russia, and 4 million Russians have residency rights in the EU. That is a comment about a country whose president recently described the EU as a hamster. Um, so in Australia, and presumably in this centre, we look, I think, with great sympathy at your dilemma uh, and with a kind of tacit support because you represent the values that are important to us. You represent the rule of law um, and you represent the chance for people to seek prosperity and ultimately you represent what was rather nicely put in an Irish folk song was England bade our wild geese go that small nations might be free. It's freedom and prosperity that people are looking for, and that's why they're still lining up to join the EU. So all I can say, gentlemen, is uh, good luck to you and wisdom to you. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Because it, it does go to what you both said earlier in the piece about this being more than just a, an economic construct. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. I, I, th I think uh, it comes back, I was, I was just thinking that as, uh, uh, as, as, as the question slash comment was being, was, was being put, it, it comes back in a way to your original question about the benefits, the reasons, why are, why are you in it? And I made the point at the time, and it's worth making again, uh, that it's not just about this hard economic relationship. People like to get hard figures, they want concrete answers, mm. you know, what's it about? And I made this point about bringing something, something to, to, to the table. Uh, there, 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 there is a higher level uh, concept of shared value systems uh, at, at work here. Um, we, we, the member states come from, they, they bring their own particular culture, history, background and context to, to, that, to that table. Um, and they find common ground. Um, we're a small country, as I've said many, many times. We still are a small country. Um, and we're, we happen to be uh, a neutral uh, country, uh, for instance. Many people would have said uh, back in the 60s when this discussion started at first that there was no place for a neutral country uh, in, a, in, a, in a European economic community. Now you find that you have post Maastricht, that you have a European Union which has a competence in the whole area of what we call Petersburg tasks, humanitarian um, uh, rescue missions, crisis management, conflict prevention, and so on. And so you find that there is a space uh, both for the neutrals, the non-neutrals, the aligned and the non-aligned, um, because we share so much and we bring, we bring all, of that, uh, all of that to the table. So yes, there is a higher level uh, concept about this, that political thing that's hard to, uh, to define. I suppose it comes back to what I was, 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 was getting at the start. It's about broadening your horizons as well, and it's about, mm. it's about evolving and de developing as a nation and a people. Ambassador, your thoughts on uh, the, the, the uh, I think, a, a poignant contribution? Well, I, I tend to agree. I think we, in Europe, uh, uh, the political reasons are very strong, the common values, the consolidation of democracy. Uh, being a part of this uh, you know, group, 27 countries now, 500 million people, the interchanges, all the, uh, I think, in which any country in cultural terms and knowing, knowing now much better, I believe, comparing even <coughs> to what I can see in the past, you know, the, the attitude towards the difference in Europe is completely different than would be uh, 60 years ago or 70 years ago. It's a really uh, idea there is really a common of purpose in many aspects, even through these difficulties, I think that this community of purpose and the, the, the need, I think the need is uh, growing of uh, that the engagement among ourselves is absolutely needed, that we cannot conceive already Europe without the European Union, which is a part of our answer a bit to the, the question of how would the European Union stand 15 years ago. Is, uh, is also a very uh, relevant factor, not only economic benefits for sure, 
uh, even though it is difficult, as we still think that I don't conceive tomorrow a single market, for instance, falling apart. It's something that for us would be, uh, one of the us would be devastating. Uh, and so I think that all these reasons you know, are still paramount, political reasons certainly, basically. But all, all, this, all these, these factors as a whole play a lot, you know, in uh, having the people even, say, dif differences now in how to cope with the crisis, which mm. is affecting uh, severely our countries, but other countries in Europe in a different way. Uh, still there is this idea, there is a common ground of understanding and capacity to work together that has certainly to stay, is to stay. In Europe. Could, could, could I just add to that, uh, if I just very briefly, I, I, I think it's, it's important to remember, it might seem uh, patently obvious, but it's important to remember nonetheless, uh, that, 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 that this, is, this is more than an organization. This is, this, is, this is a project, as Peter described it, uh, a project in pooled sovereignty which hasn't been tried before. Mm. Uh, and it's always a work in progress. To come back to your 15 years idea, mm. um, who would have said 15 years ago that we'd be talking about common foreign security policy, uh, common security and defence policies, mm. humanitarian tasks and so on and so forth. And, and just in a nutshell to say that I think despite what we're seeing now in terms of the, the, the discussion that's happening in public, the European Union is not defined by the Eurozone crisis. Just as our relationship, Ireland's relationship with the European Union and its place within the European Union is not defined by the, the Eurozone crisis. It's, it's affected by it, it's not defined by it, it's a part of it, but it's a process. Uh, it may seem terribly obvious, but I think it's important to say that because you could be forgiven, one could be forgiven for thinking uh, that that was, a, it goes much deeper uh, than, than what is the, 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 uh, uh, the, subject, uh, the subject du jour. There was uh, some reaction, Peter, today to uh, the comments made by Tony Abbott yesterday in, in Beijing about the China not uh, evolving uh, politically as it has economically, it needs to do it more quickly. Controversy about that. I don't want your thoughts on that, but <laughs> I suppose in that context I'll ask you about the gentleman's contribution at the back that it's about what Europe stands for and, and those Australia and Europe share a lot of commonalities on that. Noel just made a very good point, which I endorse. That you know, it's we we tend to forget in the in the problems of today how much has been achieved. You know, when you think of of what um, misery Europe inflicted on itself and the rest of us in the first half of the last century, <laughs> and and what it's done since to ensure that that sort of thing doesn't happen again, I mean, it's it's very easy to take achievements for granted. But this is. You know, this is something of you know great historical importance, mm. and uh, you know we want to see a, a stronger, more united Europe, and we think that's what Europeans want, and that Europe's role in the world uh, is important and should you know more power to you. Thanks, Peter. On that note, it's a good way to finish, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. A big round of applause, please.